Hello, welcome to the Key Life session, a session dedicated to sharing knowledge about business automation technologies, rules automation, decision processes, con uh, constraints over, and much more resource planning and uh, tools to help with that with those things too. And uh, hey, Porcelli, as usual, how are you doing today? I'm good. How are you, Karina? <laughs> I am doing good too. I'm looking forward for this topic because I don't think we've talked about this before here in the key life sessions. Yeah, I think it's the first time that we're bringing this topic. And it's a very interesting topic because we are talking a lot about even driven architectures. But uh, one aspect that we can plug it in is this uh, CEP topic to, to the mix. And uh, we'll hear now from the specialist about the topic. Indeed. We have Luca Molteni here with us today, and he's a core developer in Drones Engine. So we, he's going to tell us how it works. He's going to start from scratch, from basics. So if you don't know anything about CEP, don't worry. We are going to cover the basics, the concepts, and he will also show a live demo. So let's bring him to stage. Hello, Luca. How are you? Thanks, thanks for joining us today. Hi, Karina. Hi, Alex. I'm the specialist. You are the specialist. <laughs> You need, to handle, you need to handle the hard questions today. <laughs> yeah, definitely. Don't worry. Ask me any hard question and I'll answer, or at least I try. Perfect. So before I share your screen, Luca, let's just yes. have a, a quick uh, small talk here. So CEP, is that only for uh, stateful use cases. So for example, if I need stateful rules execution, is that the only case or like, what is it about? What are the use cases? So I want to monitor something using rules. Like give us a really short introduction. Like if you had to talk in an elevator. Elevator what pitch. Is it for? Elevator pitch. Um, you're going to spoil my, my presentation like this. It's really quick. It's just an intro. Hello, Flo. So, yes, I'm back. <laughs> yeah, don't worry. Um, yeah, CP is a very powerful tool to, to address all kind of needs when you need to process events. In this presentation, we're going to see what events are and how to are they are processed by Drews and some of the use cases. I think it's a really interesting topic. Totally. And by the way, we have been talking a lot about the cogito generation and how Drews is evolving towards uh, feeding into the, the cogito generation and other rule unit stuff. So in the end of the talk, are you also going to talk a little bit about what to expect in that space? Yes, definitely. Um, cogito is our next generation product and uh, we are targeting cogito for CP as well. We have to remember that Cogito for the Drews, for the Ruse part is mostly based on Drews. It yeah. basically shares the same code. So all the functionalities that we already have on, on Drews, they are all supported. And it will be, I mean, it will be even better in the future. But we see that at the end of the presentation. Ooh, looking forward to it. So mm -hmm. go ahead, share your screen and uh, uh, the stage is yours. By the way, as usual. Feel free to share any questions in the chat. If this is your first time here, you are more than welcome to have a chat uh, with the other folks on the on the yeah on the live chat there on YouTube, and uh, we'll be here watching it. Okay, so Luca, can we interrupt you during the presentation? You know I love interrupting people, right? Yes, yeah, sure, <laughs> whatever you want. I also have a, a few moments where you can ask directly questions. So okay, awesome. Okay, so let me share my screen in here. Mm -hmm. um, I thought you were going to use a guitar t-shirt today. Oh. <laughs> no, actually I'm not. Going all black. <laughs> Go so, for it. <laughs> to look, you know, better. Uh, so welcome to this presentation called uh, Event Driven Drools. In this presentation, we're going to explain what, what CEP is. And by the way, you've already seen in the slide, it stands for Complex Event Processing. And we're going to explain why it's important uh, today. But uh, before we start, let me spend uh, a few and talk to a few minutes and talk to you about the Drews community in general, because I think it's very important. So you have uh, a few ways to talk to us. And depending on what kind of questions you have, one channel might be better than the other. So if you want to take a look at how we work and have maybe have a quick chat with us, you can use the Zulip channels. Um, on Zulip, you can talk directly to us and you can talk about problems and we can guide you towards a solution. 
um, please be aware that we don't necessarily provide answers in real time. So please be respectful of the developer's time and please don't ask questions such as how do I do this? Please, it's urgent, I need it. Um, but we are open to, we are, we, we are there just to, to help you. And also avoid using private messages on, on Zulip and please ask questions on the public board so that everybody can answer you. If you don't have a, a chat with us and you just want to ask a question, a very specific question, Stack Overflow is great as well. You will find very many good Druze developers. And uh, we also have a mailing list if you've prepared this kind of thing. And uh, so we're waiting for you on these channels. By the way, Luca, it is hard to expect like a, a quick answer because we have people spread all over the world. So. <laughs> yeah, the good part okay. about having people all over the world is that uh, you probably find somebody always awake, right? Yes, Whether exactly. it's in Japan or in Europe or in Brazil or in uh, America. Awesome. Um, yes, but uh, please don't push us. I mean, um, don't ask for questions uh, uh, directly and don't expect answers uh, quickly. Mm -hmm. I'm sorry. Go. It's just the way it is. So this is the agenda for today. We're going to have a, a small introduction of the concept of real-time computing. And then we're going to see what Alex was addressing before. Uh, so it would be even processing uh, um, related to orchestration and uh, system orchestration in particular. Then we're going to see some of the details of um, how to make a CEP setup in rules. And then we're going to see some details on how to write actual CEP rules. Sounds nice. So let me start with the concept of uh, real-time computing. Uh, it, it's important to understand real-time computing to understand the, the context in which uh, CP happens. So the real-time computing is a specific branch of computing in which the response time of a system is a key component of a result. So in other terms, we might say that in a real-time system, we don't care not only about the result, but also when we receive it. Now, sometimes when we receive the response might be even more important than the actual result. So imagine that uh, unfortunately you're in a hospital and you receive a warning from a machine att attached to a patient. You still have to check if the machine is correct or maybe it's a false positive, but it's important that you receive the signal as soon as possible, right? So in that case, when you receive the signal, it's more important than the actual signal. So let me give you a few more examples of uh, real-time computation versus non-real-time. Um, for example, a not real-time computation uh, might be this. So a big company is asking you to create a report out of a database. And uh, we probably don't care about how long it takes to get this report. Most probably the management would want to have it as soon as possible, but most of the time they won't care if it's delivered in 30 minutes or just in one hour. The computation time is probably irrelevant. There might be cases in which of course it's relevant, but for the most cases, so instead, let's imagine that you're flying to your destination on a plane and suddenly one of the engines of the airplane stops working. So the pilot wants to be alerted as soon as possible to take the eventual steps to land the airplane safely, right? In this case, time is an essential factor of the computation. If the information is delivered late, the safety of the passenger can be put at risk. So it's important that the software of the airplane runs on a real-time system so that we are sure that information comes instantly. So imagine if you are flying on an airplane and the, the airplane system runs on Java and the, it runs the garbage collector while you're flying. And maybe the engine stops working and the pilot knows about it only 10 minutes after. It's not that great, isn't it? <laughs> Um, so in this example, the example of the airplane, we call the information of the engine stopping an event. So you might have now a general idea of what an event is, right? So it's something that happens in a specific moment in time and it changes the state of a system significantly. So event processing 
is a set of tools that let, let, that let the developers write programs against those facts to process them and act accordingly. To give you another example, typical example of CEP, uh, an important event for somebody might be the fact that, I don't know, the price of a Bitcoin is currently under $2,000, for example. Maybe it's a good idea to buy it. I don't know. I'm not into buying cryptocurrencies. It's probably not as important as an airplane having a problem, but uh, it's still a good example of an event. So as I said before, but I want to, to make things clear. Um, Drews is uh, mostly a rule engine. It's not an end-to-end real-time solution. It's not intended to give you, to provide you any guarantees of delivery time, similar, for example, of a stock trading system, something like that. But Drews does execute a lot of rules very fast. And it does provide tools to process events by writing rules in the same language that we use to write the business rules, which is DRL. Uh, by the way, DRL stands for Drew's Rules Language. And today we're not seeing the details of Drew's Rules Language, but uh, if you remember my other key live, by the way, you're going to find it on the YouTube channel. Anyway, if, you're taking, if you take a look at my other key live, we gave all the details regarding DRL, what it is and how it's used. And Drew's uses the same, the same exact language to, to write rules regarding time. So, in other term, if you think you're in a situation with time is an important factor, uh, a bit not critical, you should, you should consider using those. Um, and you might also want to consider Cogito as well in the future, as we already say, because uh, it will become, hopefully, an end-to-end -end cloud native business automation solution that can react to domain specific events. So the keyword here is cloud native. Imagine having all this in the cloud. So, let me give you a few more details on what is CEP. So CEP is an evolution of the event processing that allows to the system to react to temporal correlation among different events. And the system, in case of course, tools, provides tools to make easy to, to the user to mix the information available by creating extractions and projections and joining different kinds of events altogether. So CEP systems have been out for a while. I think this, this specific feature in Drews have been out for, I don't know, Alex, if you can help me, something like seven years or maybe more. I think but, more. Yeah, maybe even 10 years. Yeah, maybe probably even. around this time. I think even before 10 years, <laughs> to be honest. <laughs> um, but around this time. And one thing when you say about what is CEP, you know, this, I got in my library this book hmm. that covers a lot of what it, CEP means. It's a, a, a book, a, a very famous book about CEP from 2010s. I think this, this edition is from 2010. Very interesting. Thank you. Uh, sure. we, we write the details of a book in the, in, the, in the description afterwards. Okay. Thank you, Alex. Thank you. But, but even though the system, the, the feature has been out for a while, maybe even when Alex was working on Drews, <laughs> it's always an actual topic. Um, for example, we use uh, CEP or we use event processing in general um, to promote the decoupling between various parts of your architecture and um, it can ease the maintenance. Let me see, let me show you a few examples of orchestrating a system using CEP. So in this example, we have diagram of um, three different microservices, the order microservice, the payment microservice and the invoice microservice. And um, they are really tightly coupled together. And this comes from an example of uh, potential e-commerce. And uh, we have the order microservice when the user buys something, the payment micro microservice when it pays for it, and the invoice when the order is fulfilled. And as you can see from the diagram, the order microservice called directly the payment microservice, and the payment microservice calls directly the invoice microservice. So we might say that uh, the orchestration logic in between microservices is uh, written directly into the microservice itself. But this also means that if something goes wrong, for example, the user cancels the payment because the payment service is not working, the payment microservice has to have the logic or how to contact the order microservice uh, to the order microservice, I'm sorry, again, to cancel the order. 
And this means that also this diagram is probably wrong because we should have an arrow pointing from the payment microservice to the order microservice. And we're surely missing many other arrows. This is just uh, an example. Anyway, the fact that uh, when something goes wrong, you have to check the consistency um, in every microservice is called the distributed transaction problem. And it's very hard to get if you have such tightly coupled components. Another problem with these uh, tightly coupled microservices is uh, when, because eventually you would have to, uh, you want to insert a new microservice in between maybe two phases. For example, in this case, we're going to insert a promotion microservice in between the order microservice and the payment microservice. And of course, since, as we said before, the orchestration logic is written inside, we have to go in each microservice and change the orchestration logic. And um, since the order now goes to the promotion, the promotion goes to the payment, we should probably remove the code that calls the payment microservice from the order. But maybe not. we shouldn't remove all the code because there will, is, there will be some path in which the user doesn't use the promotion microservice in which goes directly to the payment. So, Eventually, it gets complicated because half of the logic is in our microservice and half of the logic is in another microservice. So definitely not a maintainable architecture, right? So if we introduce some kind of event processing to orchestrate microservices, we decouple the services from one another. So instead of having the orchestration logic inside the services, each one will fire events and other services will react to those events. For example, the order microservice can have the order created event or the order canceled event and so forth. And in this case, Druze will be the event bust that will orchestrate the various events and the CEP logic will be written within Druze, within the business rule and using the RL. And of course, there will be some specific reaction logic isolated inside microservice, but most of the logic will be inside the event bus. And adding a new service will be a matter of just creating a new type of events and handling them. And uh, regarding the distributed transaction problem that we were discussing before, um, we might have events that sing on the services of the eventual problems or error in the process so that each service can roll back its transaction independently, leading to a more robust distributed transaction mechanism. So this is how we use uh, an event-based uh, processor to have a better architecture and why CPs were always actual even today. So another thing that we might say that uh, also modern reactive Java development uh, in, in some in some of the libraries there is some kind of complex event processing. If you take a look at Vertex, for example, which is a very famous framework to look to write uh, reactive applications in Java, or maybe we saw an example from the the Camel Bridge of Vertex. Uh, you can see that the idea of passing event is everywhere. So it's an old concept that is still actual. So let me give you a few more examples what we know about how the user, the Druze user, are using CP4. We, we are pretty sure, because we, we, we don't know exactly, but we're pretty sure that they're using it for stock market, they're using it for IoT systems, they're using it for fraud detection, and for monitoring. And today we're going to see some example taken from the monitoring system, uh, to be honest, a very, very simple monitoring system. And uh, you can find the source code here on my repository in, uh, in GitHub. So this is the end of the first part in which we saw the idea of real-time computing and how to use uh, event processing for orchestrating microservices. Are there any questions? Not at the moment. We can move forward. Thank you. Thank you, Karina. Um, so let's discuss um, some of the details and uh, how CEP is in actually implemented in rules. So firstly, um, we should talk about evaluation mode in Druze. So by default, Druze runs in this mode that is called cloud mode. Please don't ask me about the origin of these names because I simply don't know anything about it. They were here a long time ago, maybe even 10 years ago. I wasn't even working on Druze. And 
I personally think that might be changed in the future because I don't think the name cloud has aged well. So cloud mode is the default for Druze in which facts uh, don't have uh, any particular orders and uh, you basically cannot use CEP with cloud mode. And to use CEP you have to enable what is called the stream mode in which uh, every event inserted in Druze will have an order and will have a timestamp and will ha you will have you you can use the temporal operators and you can you can also use um, other features such as uh, sliding windows for example so to configure the cloud mode or stream mode you can do it in uh, in the k module or can do it in java uh, I might say that most of the time it will probably do in the in the K-module XML because in most of the project uh, you either have CEP enabled or you either don't. I can see where there is a case in which you want to enable CEP programmatically using Java, but still, I don't know, there might be cases. So you also have a Java programmatic interface. So, but uh, the interesting part about this slide this slide, I'm sorry, is that uh, if you take a look at the key session, uh, the type of the key session is um, stateful session. Do you know why? Karina, do you know why, since you were asking this question before? <laughs> if it, uh, why it needs to be stateful? Yes. Because generally we maintain defects in memory, uh, <laughs> even after the, re the request is finished, right? Isn't that it? Exactly. Perfect. So we, I think that we already discussed the differences between a stateless computation and a stateful one in the other key life, right? But uh, I think that a quick reminder is always useful. So in a stateless computation, the results are computed only based on the input provided by the user. In a stateful computation is that the results are based on the input and on the current state of a system. In our case, Dulce's working memory. And since we are dealing with time, it's essential in a CEP computation to have the memory of every event inserted in the past, as Karina was saying, because they are needed to trigger the specific business rule. For example, if I need to trigger a rule that fires after five minutes have passed from the current event, I need as an input the current event, which is the input from the outside, and every single event that happened before. So basically that's the state of the system so that I can check my temporal constraint. If there are events that were received before five minutes, the rule shouldn't fire. So I might also say this, that basically CEP with a stateless session is not supported. But it doesn't mean that it can't be done theoretically, because theoretically we could correlate the input events from the system with uh, the historical data and uh, the historical events stored in the, maybe in another system outside the boundaries of truth. For example, we might store all the events in the database and we could theoretically correlate the, the historical data outside the rule engines and do, and do only the, the temporal computation in Drews. Uh, this case was never explored in Drews, but that doesn't mean that it's not possible, but actually is not supported at all. Uh, but it could be useful in the future and maybe it could also lead to a better distributed computation, but we don't know yet. So those user, of course, will have to use a stateful session and it's also much more convenient and easy to use. So finally, we're going to see in Drews what is an event. And the definition of an event in Drews is very simple. It's a, a simple fact that a simple object that you insert inside the working memory with a timestamp or two. If you don't provide a timestamp, um, the insertion type will be used. And to say that a, that a class and that a type is uh, not only a fact, but is also an event, you can use this, uh, this annotation called or key API definition type role, which you have to pass event, and you can use it either on the POJO if your POJO is yours, or maybe on the declare type or via DRL if you, the type comes from an external jar. I won't get into the details. I please ask you to check the, the, the Druze documentation, which is actually very good, and uh, they will explore all the ways to, to define uh, effect in Druze. But the important thing that we should talk about uh, is uh, the difference between point in time, also called punctual, versus the interval events. 
So a point in time or punctual event have only a single timestamp. Imagine that uh, there is an event from an IoT system such as the central heating system, the heating is on or air conditioning is on. Um, while instead, the inter interval events have a starting timestamp and a duration. And for example, maybe a phone call, a phone call will start and it will have a timestamp of when the phone call has started and then a duration. Duration will, will be how long does it take to, to make a phone call. Uh, this is important because uh, the temporal operators that we're going to use in a DRL act differently depending on the you're using on the on point in time event or in interval events, but we see them later. One other important thing that we have to say, uh, it's about immutability. Uh, immutability, you probably already know this, is the idea of the event uh, that you shouldn't change the objects when they're inserted. And uh, of course, events are immutable. If you start modifying immut uh, immutable events, then the worst thing will happen. So we cannot enforce immutability because, as you probably already know, Drus is based on Java and Java doesn't enforce mutability any, anyhow. Uh, but we can ask the user, please do not change the timestamps of the events. Otherwise, something bad will happen to your system. What you could do instead is to enrich the events with new data. But please, please, please don't change the existing. Okay. So let me give you a quick summary of what we've seen. We see the difference between the cloud and the stream mode. We've seen the, the idea of stateful session. We saw how to define an event. We saw the difference between punctual and interval events. And we saw the idea of mutability. If everything is all right, we're going to move to actually writing um, CEP rules. Any questions? I won't ask again, Karina, because we don't have any questions. Today. Exactly, we don't. We can move on. <laughs> it's probably better for the best. You know, I would interrupt you every single time, right? So, yeah. The only, time that, the only moment when I take time to ask questions, ask if there are any any questions, there aren't questions at all. So, so let there me is see. a question now, since you asked. Since you <laughs> yes. asked. Okay, so, please. Um, I heard that stateless sessions implementation is better for CEP with truths. Is that a thing? Where have you heard it? No, oh, no I, it's from Vinay. Uh, I'm sorry, can you repeat uh, that? So yeah, with stateful session, how engine memory can hold so many events coming in? Let's say fraud detection to correlate over a few hours. Uh, the person, Vinay, heard that stateless sessions implementation is better for CEP with truths. Can you comment on this? I mean, stateless computation is not supported. Uh, but yes, the, the problem that the, the user is talking about is a very important problem, and we're going to see it later. It's about the okay. memory management problem. Uh, I'm sure you will say something about it. OK, perfect. Um, so let me talk a little bit about CP and rules. And let's see an actual example, right? So let me unshare the screen in here, stop sharing. Share, share screen, I'm going to take a window. Okay, just wait a second. See if explained. Can you see my screen in here? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Thank you, Alex. So this is a very, very simple example taken from the Drus archetype. So we're using 759.0 final which is the latest community version. And we are also using the Drews Engine Classic, but I must say that uh, CEP is totally supporting the executable model as well, which is really important because as you might already know, the executable model will be the default for the Drews 8 initiative and the Cogito in general. So we're just using the Drews Engine Classic just for historical reason. So this is a very simple project, and um, it's an example of a monitoring system. So let me try and give you and write some rules, some CEP rules. So first of all, we're going to deal, we're going to see the domain object. We're going to see the very, the basic example, the simplest example that we can think of, the heartbeat. So the heartbeat in this case is a POJO, and this POJO is annotated with this annotation called role, role typing event, as we saw before. And this annotation timestamp 
and the TS stands for the name of a field. So in this case, we are saying that TS is the field that will store the timestamp. Also, as we saw before, you can see in the K module XML that uh, the K base is uh, the key base, however you want to call it, is um, defined as event processing mode is stream and the key session is defined as stateful. So we want to write our first, very first simple monitoring rule. So let me take my notes here and let me move a bit my microphone because I need to write on the keyboard. So we're going to write a rule called the heartbeat rule. So the rule, we call it heart, uh, heartbeat rule. So we have a when part and then an end part. So we're going to create the first pattern. The first pattern we're going to create on an actual heartbeat. So when we receive a heartbeat from the outside, and this is our first event that we're going to receive, and we're also going to create a binding for the field of the heartbeat. And also we're going to create a binding for the heartbeat itself. It's important because now we're going to correlate this fact with the um, I'm sorry, this event with another event. And this event is a bit strange because it's not an event that says that there is a heartbeat, but it's an event that states that there is no other heartbeat. More specifically, there is no other heartbeat that is different, of course, from the initial heartbeat. And it hasn't been received in a time in between 0 second and 5 seconds. So this is the first example of temporal operator that we actually ever see. Um, so this means that they are in this current state, when this rule will fire, there will be a heartbeat event and there won't be any, any other heartbeat. So any other heartbeat, of course, different from initial heartbeat after five seconds. So in other term, we are going. What we are going to see here is that we have we have received uh -oh. a heartbeat. Uh -oh. You cannot go forward. You know, I would interrupt you. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry. So let me to... ask you. So uh, double checking. So here yes. uh, we are just confirming that we are validating if there's any other execute other heartbeat object instance within the working memory. And yes. uh, in the end of this, after five seconds, you have the variable s there. Could you explain it, please? Dollar uh, s in the end. Oh, it's just a typo. I'm sorry. It's dollar mm. h. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Okay, sorry. I don't know why s, by the way. It's just it's also distant from the keyboard, so it's a strange typo. <laughs> anyway, yes. Um, this just means that we, we've received just one heartbeat, but we haven't received any more. It's really important. It's a typical system in which you receive a heartbeat every five seconds, and if you don't receive it, then something goes really wrong. And uh, what we'll do is that we also using a global variable, a control set, which is a DQ, which is basically a stack, a Java stack, to actually push the last event that we received. And uh, this is important for testing purposes, and we see it later. So let me try and write this. Ah, uh, let me say a spoiler. So are you firing firing all rules? One of the questions that we have here is is like, so in CEP, the events yes. are the input facts, and there's no need to fire all rules. Does that mean that the rule evalu evaluation is done every time a new event comes in? So there are two ways of evaluating rules using CP. And the one that uh, the user is describing is the um, uh, continuous way, also called fire until held. Uh, fire until held is a method that we have on a key session in which uh, it does exactly what the user is saying. So basically, rules will spawn a different thread that will stay alive and uh, that will react each time that something happens. Um, in this time, we're going to see a different approach in which we directly call fire all rows. Um, we're going to discuss this later, but it's important since the user ha has asked this question now. There are two different ways of interacting, and they're both supported. And uh, it's not one is not necessarily better than the other. They just deal with different uh, scenarios. And later, we are going to see the specific of a scenario. Does this answer this question? Yes, thank you.
great. Let me take my notes because I don't have a good memory here. So we're going to write a test because uh, you probably write tests for your application, right? If you don't, and if you don't, something. yeah, don't let us know. Just start <laughs> writing it. <laughs> yeah, we don't actually care. I mean, it's your system. No, I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. We care because we care that your system works flawlessly. So what we're going to do is we're going to insert a global object inside uh, what's what is name control set yes i'm going to write a pass a collection in which we can collect the the events that were fired so that we can make assertion on it so what we're going to do is actually sim simulate the test i'm going to create a new heartbeat and the heartbeat will have um, the date so the timestamp will be date from instant now and then uh, we are going to insert the HB1 and uh, we're going to fire our rules. So, so Karina, since today oh. you're on fire, what will no, happen now? No, Alex! Alex is not joining! Come on, Alex! Come on over! Uh, Alex so knows the answer. He's been working for this for so many years, so he already knows the answer. Tell me. Thank you! <laughs> what is the question? But what, if, what will happen here? So we inserted just one event and we have a rule that will fire. We have one event, but we don't have any more events after five seconds. In our, this is actually a range in between zero seconds and five seconds. What will happen? I, uh, are you set to stateful mode? Yes, I am. Okay, so I think it will not fire because you are only firing, firing all the rules once. So you insert the object, you fire the rules. And then I, I think rules won't evaluate it again because you're not firing the rules again. So let's see. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's interesting. I mean, the test will fail, actually. Uh, in this case, uh, I'm assuming that the control is, um, is populated with the event, but the rule hasn't fired. If you take a look, there is no printing in, um, in the system. So the heartbeat won't detect anything. It won't work basically exactly. in this way. Yeah, let's. You have just one heartbeat in a way. You you're doing a join with a different one. No, I'm doing a join with the oh. the fact that there is no other heartbeat after oh, the first okay. one. Okay. But what happened is that actually the time hasn't passed. Mm -hmm. So without passing, the rules cannot know that uh, actually, I mean, the rule will fire when the time will pass. As we saw at the beginning of uh, this presentation, time is an essential factor in this computation. And if we, for, if we, if, I'm sorry, if we forget about time, then uh, we won't understand how the, the rules works. And in fact, in fact, if we insert the, the first heartbeat and then uh, We'll wait for six seconds and then we fire a rules. We will see that uh, mm. we'll see the system out heartbeat not receiving five seconds. So what happened there is that it actually identified the moment that you inserted the fact there, right? It's using it's using as a timestamp. It's using the field that we annotated in the in the mm -hmm. in the project. Do you remember? That oh we yeah. We use the timestamp annotation TS mm -hmm. for the field. But what, what actually is, is happening is that if you don't wait six seconds, uh, Drews cannot know if uh, this answer should fire or not. And um, that's it, pretty much. So, as I said before, time is an essential part of the computation. So, Alex, Karina, do you see any problem with this test? Do you like it? I think you're not comparing two heartbeats. You need to insert Thread at least two. Thread no. Thread sleep, no. no. <laughs> Alex got the right answer. I mean, the test is fine. I mean, it's testing the no, functionality. No, it's not fine. <laughs> I mean, it's fine. It's not great. <laughs> it's actually testing the functionality. But take a look at this, Karina. This test is oh, taking my gosh. seven seconds to Imagine run. Imagine we had 10 of these. Oh, exactly. Gosh. Imagine you have thousands of these. Imagine having your... <laughs> yeah, it's having your continuous lines. integration suite, uh, like waiting for sixty no. six thousand seconds work. just because uh, there are slips. Mm -mm. As Alex said before, using slips uh, inside your code is just bad. Uh, what Drews provide uh, is the idea of using a pseudo clock, which I'm pretty sure is a 
pronounced pseudo clock in English, I'm not sure because in Italian is different. Anyway, uh, pseudo clock is a very powerful tool um, to have some kind of virtual clock. And this virtual clock is a clock that we can actually command from the outside. And in this, it's especially useful when you want to do testing. So let me show you an example of the same test that we've written before, but using the pseudo clock. To set the pseudo clock, you have to ask to the queue service the actual the, the configuration item to set the option to clock type options pseudo. And then uh, let me see, you have to use a method in the key base that, uh, yes. So this would be would helpful pass. for testing purposes. It's definitely helpful for Perfect. testing purposes, purposes, but not only actually, but you see that later. Mm -hmm. um, so we, what we're going to do in here is uh, we're creating the heartbeat. Okay, so let me copy and paste. I'm sorry, I'm lazy. Ah, wrong key. Let me copy and paste the first part of the test because it's the same. So we have a session and we set the globals, which is the same as before. But instead, now we're going to ask for the question, um, the clock, the actual clock. And this return a pseudo, a session pseudo clock. Yes. Now that we have the, the pseudo clock, we can, use, we, we can do some interesting things, such as, for example, we can create a heartbeat, heartbeat one, I wrote H and heartbeat one. And then we're going to set the, the timestamp as we did before. And we're going to use this uh, very simple method that I've written before because otherwise it's a convenient timestamp from pseudo clock. So what we will do is that it will take, it will ask uh, to the session pseudo clock for the current time. And then we are going to instantiate it with this instance and uh, date from. So instead of using, take a look at this, it is important. Instead of using the instant now, which is as bad as the thread sleep in a test, and you should probably avoid that, we ask for the timestamp to the, to the actual pseudo clock. So what we can do now is we're going to insert the heartbeat one object inside. And uh, okay, so in the test before we had the thread slip now, what we're going to do instead is we're going to ask to the session clock to advance time. And as you can see, this is basically a virtual clock. So let's wait time five seconds, then we fire a rule. And then probably the assertion will be again, the same as before. Ah, let me write. Let me run this, see if it works. See the clock, it works and not only, it ran in only one second, which is fine. Oh, by the way, we should probably... Thanks for it. that. Yeah, it's great, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, it is. <laughs> yeah, we know our user, our users. So you should probably check for this also as well. It's interesting because in the... In the, in the stack, you will find the last event that has, uh, has fired, so we have this. So this is the first example. How Wait, much time do we have? Go to the next one. I still have one thing here. So about this example, yes. if we let 12 second pa seconds pass, will it fire twice? Let me see. No, it will fire only once. Because you are only firing the rule once. If you fire it twice, then it would write. Yes. Show it exactly. twice. Exactly. No, it will fire only once. Um, oh, even if you I'm, fire it twice, it, uh, is it because yeah. of the. Uh, I, mean, I don't know why. Um, I think it's somehow related to how Drews manage, manages the event. And we're going to see that later because we have a specific slide regarding this. And um, so it, let's it, move it, forward. Because yes, there's let's a question move about that, by the way. <laughs> yeah, but we're going to see that later, actually. Um, we only have 15 minutes. I wanted to show it to you uh, how much no, time. No, do we don't have? worry. I can stay a little bit more around. Okay, perfect. Thank you. Uh, I wanted to show you a different, I'm sorry, I have to take it all from the, from the notes in here. I wanted to show you another example because it's interesting as well. 
And um, so let me write this. This is a much more complicated example. And it's a monitoring system that has a rule specific for uh, when the computer uh, is being rebooted uh, too many times. So when, then, and, okay. So we have an, a different event now. We have a system reboot event. As you can see, this is much different than before. And first, the first big difference is that this is not a punctual event anymore. This is an actual um, an interval event that has a timestamp and a duration. So the timestamp will state when the system has started and a duration will, stay, will say will stay basically how long does it take to be rebooted. We also have a computer ID and a user ID. Computer ID is useful and we're going to see that later and user ID is useful if we want to correlate this event with other facts. So what happens? Uh, as before, we have an event that the system has been rebooted, right? System reboot event, in which we have the computer ID and we have also the user ID, which is the user ID, right? Everything is clear now. So now we're going to count how many times the system has been rebooted in a specific window. To do that, we're going to use the accumulate function which is a very powerful function of trues. Um, this number of time is number. So we're going to see if um, the, the computer has been rebooted more than two times. So in this case, we're going to write from accumulate. We're going to close the accumulate in here. And uh, we're going to count all the other events. They are system reboot events that are different from the first one. This is similar to the example we saw before, right? We were counting the other events that weren't the actual original event. And that were, of course, that were dealing with rebooting the same computer because we don't want to count the other's computer being rebooted. And uh, this is the temporal operators of CP that we are going to use. Meet uh, is, um, I'm sorry. Meet is a temporal operator that will state that uh, a time, an interval event happened exactly after the first event. So in this case, what we are counting here is that uh, the system is being rebooted twice. So a system is uh, goes to reboot and then is up and then it goes reboot again. It's probably a strange situation, you know, because a server may goes into continuous cycle rebooting. And uh, we also added a parameter in here, which we say if it's rebooted in one hour. So if it's rebooted after in, in, in a one hour window, the, what we want to do is to actually count the events. I'm missing something here. No, accumulate is closed. Probably I'm missing something, but we see that later. So what we do, what we're going to do as the same we're going to do something like your computer has been rebooted too many times. Uh, like this. Plus the number of times. So what we are also going to do here, which is interesting, is we're going to do a simple join, a simple pattern matching on the user. Of course, in this case will be the user ID and uh, notified equals false, I'm sorry, equals false. Okay, so that now we have the name of the actual user of a computer, maybe the system administrator, right? And uh, so we can do something like uh, you get username, your computer has been rebooted too many times. And then as we did before, we add, the user to the user notified collection dollar u and then we're going to do here is that uh, we would like not the user to be notified many times so we basically in the pattern matching here we say that uh, it hasn't been already notified so in this way we're going to avoid the user to be notified twice and at the same time we want to signal to Drews that uh, we're going to change um, uh, a field on the actual fact, so that set notified true. I think we explore this in uh, 
in the other key lines. So take a look at it at the modify statement, which is really important. So any questions? Would you like to see if it, this works or not? I really hope so. Live coding in motion. <laughs> of course it doesn't. Uh, of course I'm missing something. Let me see, probably parenthesis. Okay, so this is this. Okay, and of course. From accumulate count. I think that I'm missing a comment here. Okay, I did it too many times, so I, that's why I have backups. Haha. <laughs> Now we have the rules written. So uh, since I think that we are running out of time, let me, instead of writing this test, let me take this test from the history, which I think it will be a bit faster. So you're going to have access to this test if you take a look at the Git repository that I've shown you before. So in this test, let me see if it runs. It runs perfectly. Yes, Luca, your computer was rebooted two times after reboot. Let's see what uh, this test does. So, of course, we're using the pseudo clock because we've learned that uh, we should use the pseudo clock. And we also set the two collections, in this case, user notified collection and the uh, control set collection. And uh, what we do is that we insert a user, which has my name, and we, we insert the system reboot event. So the first time it has been rebooted, then we wait for 20 minutes, now it has been rebooted again, and then it's been, uh, we wait another 10 minutes, and then it's being rebooted again. So it's, it has been rebooted two times more than the first reboot. And of course, we're going to, to see that uh, this happened. So let me show you the rules again. So we're going to fire the rule in case there are two more system reboot events of the same user, of the same computer that implies the same user in one hour. Is this clear, Karina? Have I gone too fast? I think it is clear. Any questions, Porcelli? No, sorry. I wasn't finding the button. <laughs> <laughs> you were okay. sleeping, Alex. Tell me. So there is a question regarding the memory management. So since yes. we're going to talk about it, I will wait for your uh, explanation. And then if the question is not uh, answered, I will ask it, OK? Perfect. Thank you very much, Karina. I appreciate this. So let me stop sharing. Let, goes, let me go back to the actual presentation. Um, just one second. Share screen, share screen, screen two, share. Okay. So we saw the demo and uh, I hope that you appreciated it. And also we saw that um, the idea of session clock, uh, basically we have a pseudo clock and a real time clock. And um, I think there aren't, there aren't any questions regarding this. Um, but uh, there was this thing which is important to say that uh, as I told uh, Karina before, there are many, there are some other uses to the pseudo clock. For example, if you're in a distributed scenario and you have many instances of truths, you might use um, the pseudo clock to synchronize the time in between different instances and between different servers. Uh, imagine doing this um, in uh, by synchronizing NTP or stuff like that, it sounds very complicated. It's better to use the pseudo clock so that uh, there is a master clock that uh, will synchronize each node and each instance of uh, your distributed computation. So uh, I wanted to talk to you about uh, all the temporal operators. Of course, we aren't seeing every temporal operators, but this is an interesting diagram of uh, how they do they behave uh, regarding the point point or point interval. Uh, for example, you can see that um, if you have only point based events, you can basically use only A before B or A coincides B, while instead if you have a mixture of point interval or interval interval, you can use uh, all, the other, um, all the other operators, all the other temporal operators. This is MEETS. 
uh, the operators that we saw before as you can see in the interval interval which was the case of a monitoring system we saw before uh, the reboot happened exactly after the first one in a period of one hour and um, please check the documentation for all the other temporal operators it's really interesting because um, in, the, in this documentation, we stated the behavior of every single temporal operators. And um, there is also that formal specification. I mean, uh, there's an example of code in how it will behave uh, if, you, if you use this, for example. This. So this is a screenshot from this documentation. And please, please read the documentation before asking questions on Zoom. Uh, I thought you were going to explain all the operators one by one. I was ready to stay here for more two hours. <laughs> Just kidding. Go to the next. That time. would be like the most boring presentation <laughs> it ever. Was. It was. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. Um, let me see. Um, so another feature that we haven't talked about is lighting windows. And sliding windows is another really important feature of, of CP. Let me go this quickly because uh, we only have a few examples of this. Um, but it's based on the fact that um, the facts from working memory are, are ordered. So we can ask, instead of asking for every event, we can ask for a specific subset of the events, in which case a window. So we have two different kinds of windows, which are length-based or time-based. And let me see an example. Um, the example, for, for example, this we are using the accumulate to calculating the average temperature of the sensor reading of uh, an IoT system, for example, as before. As you can see, we aren't checking for every event in the, in the working memory. We just care about the latest 10 minutes. And of course, if you want to have an average of a temperature, you shouldn't consider all the state of your working memory. And um, let me see if we have the same example, which you can see it's very similar, except from window time or window length, in which we, in this case, we only consider the latest uh, 100 events. It's a very powerful feature. And um, we discovered after a while that um, users don't like to specify the window each time, especially it's useful to have some kind of way to give a name to a window so that the users cannot, uh, um, if, if they have to change the window, basically they, they only have to change it once. So there is this way in which you can declare, an, declare a specific window. And uh, for example, an uh, example before, you see the window length. In this case, we added also some kind of documentation. So this is sliding windows. And let, let me go straight to the memory management. This is a, this is a hot topic. So the idea of CEP is strictly related to the stateful session. And of course, those need to know every event that has happened in the past. And uh, this could lead to memory management problem. Um, the, the amount of RAM available could end. And this could happen especially fairly quickly in case if you have many, many events, of course. Um, we know that these days the computers have so much RAM that uh, could store a lot of events, but of course we, we have to think about memory allocation when using CP and using the stateful session. So two ways to deal with uh, the memory management is like to have an explicit expiration for events in the memory management. For example, now we are annotating this stock point event, which we're saying that um, the, the event will expire after 30 minutes. This is of course the explicit is the simplest uh, example, the event will be removed after 30 minutes. And of course, only the domain experts writing those rules will know how meaningful an event and how much an event will, will have to stay inside the working memory. So you have to think about it carefully. But we also have automatic memory management that is really interesting. This is a very powerful mechanism in which Druze optimizes the working memory so that they can remove the unused facts automatically. And it's probably what was happening in the example before. Those knowing that the, the fact uh, wasn't matching anymore, just simply removed the fact from the working memory. That, that, that was why uh, firing the rules two times didn't fire the event two times. And um, so let me see, let me show you this example instead. So let's assume that we have um, two different kinds of events, a buy order event and acknowledge order event. And this is the only rule in the key base. 
So the acknowledge order event is always associated to the buy order. And the acknowledge order has to come 10 seconds after the buy order. So what does that mean if that if if a buy order comes but in 10 seconds it doesn't come anything about it so basically the same example as we saw before in the heartbeat but instead they are using two different events instead of just one what Drews will do it will remove the buy order event from the working memory this is because we stated before that this rule is the only rule in the whole key base so Drews assumed that um, there won't be any other matches it's, it's a very powerful mechanism but could lead to strange behavior so uh, I suggest you to always take a look at the state of a working memory so that uh, you don't get uh, such strange behavior. And also, I don't. I think this is why you shouldn't put too much custom data inside events because events can be collected automatically by Drews. So if you store too much data inside uh, inside an event, then Drews might remove the, the event itself. So you might lose data. Uh, Karina, does this answer the, the user's questions? Uh, let's wait. Uh, so, David, okay. please let us know if this answers your question. If forward. not, I can uh, I can uh, ask. There's time because for basically, he, yeah, basically he was asking like how Drews handles this memory management. If it uses a specific technology or if it manipulates the effects itself. So basically, basically he was asking how it works under the covers. Mm. Um, it's a really interesting question. It basically just re uses the. Um, the delete keyword of uh, the way its behavior is uh, identical to explicitly delete an event from a working memory but instead it's done automatically if you're using the inferred expiration and it's used and it's done of course automatically if you explicit the the timestamp the expired timestamp of an event mm. and okay yeah because yes. i think like he, the literal question was like how Drew stores the events in memory when we are using this stateful stuff. So it basically, uh, it, how, how does it mark an instance not to be, in, to be, for example, cleaned by the garbage collector or stuff like that? You know, I think it it's more, it more something like uh, on the mem on the instance itself. I think the question. Um, there is also a follow up question from David Williams about um, uh, if it would be possible to use something like uh, InfiniSpan. Um, as I said before, it might be possible, but it wasn't explored. Mm -hmm. So the beauty of Drews is, of course, it's an open source project, so you're free to experiment as much as you want. Um, but I wouldn't assume that this is supported out of the box. You might have to do something. Uh, but Dave, is that the name? Dave, if you want to, to do this, so please join us on Zulip and we'll happily... Yeah, Vinay also together. works. Yeah, Vinay asked the same thing, like, can I use... Uh, InfiniSpan or DB, and then uh, pull uh, pull the information and use it as a stateless session. So yeah, people uh, are considering different scenarios. I think it's an interesting dis discussion to have uh, on Zulip, right? Yes, definitely. As I said before, the, the this idea of doing CP on a stateless session, I think I personally think it's a very powerful one, and uh, it's something that we have to explore in the future. But uh, to be honest, we haven't. Okay, and thank you. So we don't know how it will work. And uh, it's the same answer to can I use InfiniSpan with this, basically. So let me go straight to this one, the rule file mode. I think that we discussed this already. Let me try to state that again so maybe it's more clear. We have two ways to evaluate rule. Discrete rule firing and continuous rule firing. In discrete rule firing, the user will decide when to run rules when we call fire or rules. And in continuous rule firing, then Drews will automatically fire the rules with an event, um, when, a, when an event matches, I'm sorry. Um, you enable this continuous rule firing using the fire until halt, uh, which will spawn a different thread, and then this thread, basically, Drews will uh, check for the events. So how to choose between the two modes depends on the cases. For example, if we already know that an absence of an event is meaningful, as we saw before, then we should probably use continuous rules firing. But um, in, the, in the other example, the one with the system reboot events, it probably it probably be used. We should use the discrete rule firing because you don't have 
um, an event, you don't have a fire without having an actual system reboot event. So when you receive an event, you can call fire rules. Why well, instead, in the heartbeat example, if we don't receive a, a signal, we have to be notified so that a continuous mode is a, is a better field. So you cannot use them both together. But of course, if you think about it, a fire until halt, so a continuous role firing, will somehow imply a fire of rules. So if you're using fire until halt, you can make you basically sure that uh, your rules will be fired. Um, but it's at the same time that the opposite of this is that you actually can simulate the fire until halt method by using uh, fire of rules with polling basically if uh, if i send a message of fire rules to the to Drews every one second then i have something like some kind of fire until halt behavior with uh, without actually using fire until halt and this is basically used because for example in the key server fire until halt is not supported so if you want to have the fire until halt, halt behavior in the key survey you have to simulate the behavior somehow like sending a fire rules payload to to the key server every how much time you want anyway the choice is up to you let let us know what you're going to use so let me conclude this with talking a little bit about cogito um, as i said before cogito is our future product and it's a cloud native, so it will support most of the feature, basically every feature as it share the same code, but it will be cloud native. So the first idea that we're exploring now is to have um, with Cogito some kind of distributed implementation of uh, CEP that will have high availability. That will be useful because of course, um, since we are dealing with stateful sessions, we don't want our instances, our pods, for example, in OpenShift to be removed and uh, our, our memory to be lost, basically. So it's really useful to have high availability in distributed uh, nodes. And uh, also we're going to support some interesting stuff, such as, for example, we are going to support cloud events messages. And this is already in the code, in the Cogito code, um, to trigger rules. So if you have to integrate with uh, the cloud events specification that uh, then uh, Cogito, we're already going to that direction. We're going to see some probably interesting things in the next month, so stay tuned. So this is pretty much the end. What do you think? Are you going to use CP in your application? Will you let us know? Will you buy our product? <laughs> our subscription, I'm sorry. <laughs> Thank you so much for the presentation, Luca. It was awesome. Uh, yeah. No worries. It's Any other powerful, questions? But with that yes, much power, it comes with a lot of responsibility, as you mentioned a few times about the memory management, because it's easy to just overload your memory yeah, exactly. with all the facts in the world and then um, just leave it there out of memory and then you're in trouble. Yeah, it's important to have the strategies to limit uh, to limit the, the existence of the objects in the memory, indeed. Uh, yeah, indeed. So something that uh, Fernando mentioned, for example, and I would like to bring this discussion to you guys. Uh, this is the literal questions. Question: May I apply this in case CP for a for a flying buying ticket system where the cost of the tickets change in short periods of time? Yes. In this case, yes. I'm sorry, uh, how do I'm you sorry see the implementation you. here, Luca? I'm like sorry, I interrupted you. Please finish. No, yeah, because one thing I would mention is it depends on the scenario because changing rules itself, that's another story. If the implementation would be to actually change the price, that's another story. I don't, I don't see that as a CEP. Could you see a scenario in that use case that you could apply CEP? I mean, the, this scenario specifically looks uh, a lot uh, like uh, the stock market scenario in which basically you react to some kind of event. So the price of an action of a stock, I'm sorry, has gone under under a, a specific threshold. I think the user is referring to the bad behavior of flying companies. Um, yes, exactly. In which they offer some offer in a specific period of time and they will have, for example, in Italy is typical that during holidays, I'm sorry, uh, I heard some noise. 
and for example in Italy it's typical that after a specific moment um, during holidays basically the the plane will cost more probably in, in every other country is the same so there is a specific window in which is better to buy ticket plane plane for ticket for planes basically so yes it's totally doable you can set up um, a system using CP and uh, in which you would use the um, you would uh, of course react to 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 this kind of events such as the price has changed and then you will buy the, the the ticket accordingly totally doable please do it and let us know awesome okay so any last thoughts before we wrap up that are those are the thoughts you might want to verbalize those <laughs> oh my fault! I I I thought that you were we were waiting about the users' fault. I'm sorry. I I was actually waiting for the users. No, I don't have any more. This is the end. I really hope that you enjoyed the presentation, and please let us know if anything comes up. Awesome! Thank you so much, Luca. Have a Thank great you. day ahead. For Chelly, next week we have another session, and next week it is going to be about. Warehouse and supermarket order picking. Ooh, resource oh. planning and stuff coming around the corner. Yeah. See you all next week. Your last thoughts for Chelly? No, that's it. Thank you very much for attending this call uh, or you are watching after the recording. Um, let us know in the comments and subscribe and like this video.